hairs on my body started standing on end. Silence. Nothing there. I fought to get back into my body. You are going to be a vital importance of helping us convince the masses. Type 471. Type 471. Bridge to the other world. Bridge to the other world. Welcome to Type 471. I'm Sam Kitchen. Now, right off the bat, I want to mention my guest and I are outdoors today, so you're going to hear, you know, interference, background ground noise, children playing, stuff like that. My guest traveled quite a distance to speak with me today, and I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, I've been wanting to speak with her for a long time. My guest today, Paula, has had a quite quite the experience. Um, it, it, I, I, I have not heard it completely yet. I will be hearing it for the first time today. But what I know so far is that she had to relocate from one area to another. That's how intense this experience was that she was having. So, and, and there, there are other components as well. We're going to get into a number of things today. So my guest today is Paula. Paula, thank you so much for being on Type 471. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, and thank you so much for traveling down here to meet with me. I, I really appreciate that. You, you, you came quite some distance. Um, you, you mentioned a, a few different elements to what you want to talk about today. Uh, they, to, to the casual listener, it may seem unrelated, but I, I, I don't think that's the case. I think it's, it's connected, and I think we need to get into all of it. You mentioned something about human trafficking to me, and w would you like to start there? Yes, that's a good place to start. Um, when I was 17, it was back in 1985, and um, I lived with only my mom. I came from a broken home, and I met a man down at the bar, local bar that was probably about a mile from where we lived. And although I was only 17, I was grown up quite mature, and, and I did what I wanted, and, um, but I was still a minor. And I met this man at a bar down the street from my house, and um, he was staying at a motel, and this, this motel, the city we were in, they happened to, um, they'll fund a parolee. When, he, when a parolee gets out of prison, they have nowhere to go. The state will house them at this particular motel for a month or longer if needed, help them while they get on their feet. And um, I met this man who was staying at this motel. And um, it, was, it was interesting because when I first met him, he told me he was there with his company. He was working with his company. He told me he travels around the United States and he works 10 months out of the year and he stays in spots for a month at a time. So he was, he was going to stay at this motel for a month with his, his company. Well, I noticed out in the parking lot, I didn't see any company vehicles or any, anything that looked like a business or company related. So I asked him, where's the rest of your company that you're here with? And he told me they, they're going to be in tomorrow. They'll be coming in tomorrow. I said, oh, okay. Well, I went back there to the motel and visited him the next day. Still no company or no business. And I asked him, where's the company, the rest of your business that you were, you're waiting for? Oh, they, they came in, but they're staying at a different motel in Concord. I said, okay. Well, I was kind of mature for my age, although I guess in some parts I wasn't. Um, every day I would go to this motel and, um, and uh, talk with them. And uh, he asked me, after, after about the third or fourth day, he'd ask me, if I could go anywhere, where would I go? I said, I'd go to Georgia to see my dad. He said, no, anywhere in the world. I told him, um, Australia. The next day, he, he gives me three envelopes. And I opened the first envelope, and it's an itinerary from Pelican Travel. It's an itinerary to go to Georgia. Uh, we were supposed to drive, uh, take an airplane to Georgia, and then I'd get a, a rental car and drive to Rock Mart and visit my dad and then come back. And then that was the first envelope, and it was an itinerary in my real first and last name. Then the second envelope I opened, it was an itinerary to go to um, Napa. 
on a train ride and this and that. And it was in my real first and last name. So then the third envelope I opened, it was an itinerary, and it was to go to Jamaica. Not Australia, where I told him I wanted to go. It was to go to Jamaica, and it was under a different last name. And I told him, I says, I would not travel out of the country under a different last name. I said, I'm not running or hiding from the police, and I have no reason to, to leave under a different last name. Well, the next day, he produced another itinerary to go to Jamaica in my real first and last name. I thought, these people down at the travel agency must think he's crazy because, well, it wasn't the travel agency. I uh, believe he had the blank itineraries, and he had receipts that made it look like he withdrew money out of the bank. He had all this stuff in the little kitchenette of the motel room, uh, which is why when I first met him, and he told me uh, they charged him 20 extra dollars for a kitchenette, and I was walking towards the kitchenette because I wanted to see what it looked like, and the door was closed. And he stopped me before I got there and told me, no, it's dirty. Said they're going to be in later and to clean it. I thought that was odd that they charged him 20 extra dollars a month for the kitchenette, but they rented it to him dirty. Well, I came to figure out that that's where he kept the computer he had and all the blank itineraries and everything he needed. Um, not one time after visiting him every day for a week and a half, not one time did I see any personal property in the motel room. There was no clothes. There was no book he might have been reading, no toothbrush, nothing. Just motel-issued towels and, and such. Well, I did notice at this motel that there was vehicles in the parking lot from out of state. There was about three different out-of-state license plates on the vehicles. And I know that one time when I was over there, somebody knocked on the door, and he let himself outside the door and closed the, the door behind him and was talking to the person. I believe that was the company he was working with. It's not a legit company. It's um, actually an organization is what I think. And um, well, after about a week or a week and a half, uh, I, and as it was, I mean, I thought I was going to Georgia to see my dad. I was excited. I was beside myself. I couldn't believe that this man who I don't know puts this money out for me to go see my dad, go on a hot air uh, or, or a train ride and, and this and that. I thought he was the best thing since sliced bread. Well, uh, every time I left his, his, the motel he was staying at, I would go by my girlfriend's house who lived real close to there, and I would fill her in on everything that, that was said. And she told me, she says, have you ever heard of human trafficking? I said, what's that? And she showed me, and she had a, a cutout from the newspaper, a big old article, and I read it. When I was finished reading it, I knew dang well that was what it was. I knew dang well that's what it was because that's exactly what it was. Everything I read in there is exactly what it was. And I wasn't scared, but I was curious. I was, like I said, 17, and, and I had a wild side. But at that point, and I was supposed to have my passport picture taken the following day. But um, at that point, I just wanted to know who this man was and what he was about, you know, because he wanted me to leave the country under a different last name and just everything about it. So I contacted the police department where I lived, and I talked to a detective. And over the phone, I gave him a description. He asked what this man looks like, and I said he looks to be about five foot five. It looks like somebody put a bowl over his head and gave him a haircut, and he's probably about 135 pounds. He says, okay, well, you come down here at 3 o'clock. He says, bring everything he gave you, the itineraries and brochures, anything he gave you, bring it with you. He says, don't come any sooner because I won't be there. So I got down there at 3 o'clock with everything that man from the motel had given me. And I sat down, and the first thing this detective did was show me a picture of a, a man in prison. He had numbers across his chest, and he asked me if this was him. If I wasn't sitting down, I would have I fallen down. My legs would have collapsed. That was the man I was talking about. There's a lot of people that fit that, that description, and for the detective to know who I was talking about, he must know something about him. Well, I, I asked the detective, I said, what was he in jail for the time this pi picture was taken? He wouldn't tell me. He, all he would tell me is, just don't go back to the motel. I said, well, I'm going back. I said, I'm supposed to get my passport picture taken tomorrow, and I'm not scared. I was just curious. I thought maybe you can help me figure out what he's up to. 
Well, I left the itineraries and brochures and stuff that the man gave me. I left them with the detective. And uh, when I left the detective's office, I was walking. I didn't have a car. I was young. I truly expected so a bullet in my head. Every step I took, I thought someone was going to shoot me. Because I knew that there was a bigger person above this, this, this guy that I met at the motel. And I knew I just got through telling on him at the police department. And, uh, and they're also, at the same time, the same month, about a m mile and a half down the road, there was a lady missing. Her name's Dottie Kalor. And um, they had a, uh, they're still looking for her. They don't know where she's at. But the same time that this went on with me, at the motel, two miles away, she supposedly came up missing from the BART station. Her husband was the last person to see her. All right, so, so I go, th all right, I leave the police department. I'm walking, and I'm truly expecting, like I said, something bad to happen with every step I took. Well, I went by the, mo uh, the motel the next morning, and the whole motel was emptied out. All the cars that had different out-of-state license plates. The man I was visiting there every day for a week and a half, everyone was gone. The motel was emptied. I went back to the detective's office, and um, I asked him, I said, uh, I'd like to get my, my stuff back, my itineraries and brochures and the stuff I brought you the other day. I'd like to get them back from you. And he says, well, I threw them away. He looked at me and told me he threw them away. And I said, well, those weren't yours to throw away. I was just letting you use them to help try and figure out who this guy is and what he's up to. So that was, that, that's, that's where that ended. He said he threw them away. The detective threw them away? He told me he threw them away, the same one I'd given it to two days prior to that. He told me he threw them away. That, that's interesting that he would throw them away and that he knew immediately the guy who you were contacting him about. And the reason I think he knew who the guy was is because... Um, like I said, when, when people get out of prison and they have no, no home or nowhere to go, the, the city or state will pay for them at, to stay at this motel while they get on their feet. Well, I think he's known for something. Obviously, he had numbers across his chest. I honestly believe the police department was getting paid off to let this organization do their thing. And when I went to the police department and told on him, he knew exactly who I was talking about because he gets paid by these people. I believe the police department then contacted them and told them somebody came down in there and, and she knows all about you. You know, they're on to you. And, uh, get, and I believe that's why the next day the, the whole motel was emptied out and they were gone. Because, because I told them, because I, 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 I found something out. And I believe that's why the detective told me he threw them away. He just wanted to end it, didn't want no proof or evidence of anything. It was over. All of these things make absolute sense that you uh, you you told on this guy to the to the police. The the police knew exactly who he was. Then your evidence was disposed of, and then everybody was gone. That makes absolute sense. Also, when he asked you uh, where in the world you would like to go, if you you know could choose anywhere to go, it, it sounds to me like. This is a line that he uses to, to get women. And, uh, you know, I mean, you said Australia, and he was going to send you to Jamaica. It sounds like that's just kind of an opener, an opening line that he uses to, to get women to go to yeah. Jamaica. Like, oh, well, you know, how about Jamaica, you know? He, he was very good at what he did. He, he walked to my house because my house was within walking distance. He just kept... To ask him, he says, now, no one's going to report you. No one's going to go to the police and report you missing, right? I told him, I says, well, I am a minor. I'm, I'm only, I'm 17 still, but I said, I do what I want. I said, uh, there's times I'll leave for three or four days and nobody calls the police. I just live with my mom, you know. And one time he walked with me from the motel to my house, but he stayed quite a distance away where if someone was to look out the door, they wouldn't have been able to see him. And, um. Uh, he just wanted to make sure that no one was going to report me missing, uh, and that was that. But he, I believe these people are born into what they do, and they're taught it from a young age because everything about it, he would have got me. He would have got me. If it wasn't for my girlfriend showing me that article on, on human trafficking, I would have believed what he was saying, and I would have been gone. I wouldn't be here right now. Yeah. Um, when, when you're saying you believe that people like that are born into what they do, what do you mean exactly? Um, what I mean is when children get of 
of school age, five, six, they go to kindergarten and preschool or whatever in grade school. I believe these people um, go to a school that teaches them how to do this, how to do it professionally, how not how to do this. That's what I truly believe. Or maybe it's an after school uh, assignment, but not just anyone can can smooth it over like that. Like you got to know what you're doing. I noticed and I was I was not too bad looking at 17. And it just surprised me that um, he never once tried to, um, he never flirted with me or tried to kiss me or do anything sexual like that. And it's a good thing because that would have caused an alarm. And I, it would, you know, he just, he knew what he was doing. Yeah, he goes after people from broken families. One, I grew up with just a mom, no father figure. And uh, so he was going to pay for me to go see my dad. That was one of the itineraries. Everything he said and did, it just was what I wanted to hear. And um, it truly would have worked had it not been for my girlfriend. Right. And I certainly agree that people who do what they do uh, would be groomed and guided and shown the ropes, you know, shown what to do uh, over a period of time. Um, I don't know if they go to school for this at a young age or taught from a young age or not, but um, I can certainly see how they would be cultivated over a period of time there there is much more to your experience we're we're just kind of breaking the 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 surface here (laughs) scratching the surface so um yeah how how does this tie into the rest of your experience would you say okay well 15 years later after this incident i was at a starbucks in the same city in concord california me and my friend got a Starbucks, and we sat down at a table outside, and there was a newspaper on the table. And on the front page of this newspaper, it showed Dottie Kalor and her husband, the woman who had disappeared from Concord the same month and the same year that that happened to me at the motel. It showed a picture of her and her husband. And when I seen a picture of her husband, I knew that was him. That was the man that tried to get me to go to Jamaica under a different last name. Oh, okay. That was him. I knew it was him. I got goosebumps. And um, it was a five-day article in the Contra Costa Times. Every day that week, there was at least two pages on it to be continued, to be continued. I'd never read an article in a newspaper that was continued for one whole week. But uh, they ended up going to the house where she was living with her husband when she disappeared. And they dug up the backyard. They didn't find her anywhere. but. Her husband was the same man that tried to get me to go to Jamaica under a different last name. I see now. Okay. I see the connection there. And um, that blew me out of the water when I seen his picture on the front page 15 years later. Because they said, if you read the story, story about Dottie Kalor and Jewel, uh, her husband, he, uh, he, they said he did some occupation where he traveled a lot. He wasn't at home hardy. Yeah, he traveled a lot. He traveled 10 months out of the year and stayed at motels for a month at a, at a time. And all I can picture is a map of the United States with 10 black dots where he'd been for a month and people missing from those areas. Um, That's all I can picture. Do you know anything about his movements during those times, like what areas he was in? I know as soon as she came up missing in 1985, he didn't waste no time. He sold the house and he moved to Utah or something. He tried to take a a, a, a Senate, uh, some sort of seat in the big house and... um, it didn't work. They found out that he was the main person, main interest in his wife's disappearance, and it didn't work out for him. But that's all I know. That's where I. That's where I stopped all anything about it. Right. Right. Okay. Um. Well, that's fair enough. I mean, you've you've got your own stuff going on. Yeah. I was just gonna say because I never got closure on that. I truly believe that there was a couple bad detectives in the Concord Police Department, and um. I just, uh, I would like to know, I don't remember the detective's name, but I would like to know if uh, there was any bad seeds back then that maybe um, got fired or was involved or uh, accused of or maybe charged or with uh, any kind of crime. Because, like I said, I truly believe the detectives were being paid off to let them run their organization. But so, because I never got closure on it, I think is why I was open to all these other things that happened to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, 
there is a lot more. So w let's start from the beginning of what else happened to you. All right. Well, I lived in a house since 2000. I lived in it for 19 years. And um, the house had negative energy, negative energy. Um, I could be sitting at the kitchen table. I had a huge ki uh, kitchen. And I could, there would, a stool would go rolling by me on wheels for no reason. And uh, I was talking to my friend when that happened, and he just, his eyes got big and round, and I didn't think anything of it. Um, my girlfriend named the ghost uh, Danny. I don't know why she called him Danny, but he tried pushing her down the back stairs one time, and she just kind of grabbed on, held on, and said, Stop it, Danny. Now stop it. And I've had two different people. Uh, described the the ghost or whatever you want to call it. They described them both the same way, and they seen them probably three days apart from each other. But they described them both the same way: scraggly hair. He looked old, older than he was, like um, real thin. And that didn't bother me. The 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 ghost there, Danny. He didn't bother me. Stuff always went on. I had uh, stuff always went. On. I had a hula hoop that was behind a jewelry box. Been there for a couple of years, and for some reason. One day it decides to roll out, shake, and fall to the ground. My dog seen that. She ran under the bed. It started affecting my dog, whatever it was. And um, I would call it episodes. Uh, I would take her to the marina, and she'd play with all her friends down there, dog friends. And sometimes she's just not feeling it. She, um, she, she wasn't herself. And I would just go down there anyway without her, and I would tell my friend, Tammy, she had Miss Jackson, the little Pomeranian. I tell her, Emmy's just having one of her episodes. Well, I didn't realize then what was going on, and I wished I would have, because ultimately it, it led in the demise of my dog. Um, what I mean by that, well, the last video I shot of her was in a particular bedroom in my house, and it looked like she was having a seizure. Her head was going up and down and back and forth. She... I think what happened was something got inside and and possessed her. Um, when I brought her to the vet, the vet told me, he says, I've never seen anything like it. He said, I gave her two high-dose shots of phenobarbital and one of Valium, and nothing's helped. I didn't have money to do any more exploring or to try and figure it out. I, I, I thought the best thing was to put her down. She was eight years old, and I had her since she was a puppy. And, um... It wasn't until, that was on August 9th, 2018. September 9th, 2018, I had a freak accident happen at my house. And I wound up in the burn unit for a month with skin grafts and so forth. This is what happened. Ne my next door neighbor was helping the guy across the street. He was going to pull some bricks out for him. And he tied a chain or a big thick rope to the bumper of his truck. And he tied it to a telephone pole tied it to the bricks and was going to pull them out. He pulled down a live wire. Okay, so we have a live wire down. Nobody calls the police or PG&E or anything else. So this live wire is hanging down on somebody's side uh, driveway. And after about 45 minutes, you know, the electricity went through the power lines and the transformer blew. It sounded like gunshots, which is nothing coming from that area. And then the lights went out. At the time, I was soaking my fake fingernails in acetone. I was trying to get these fake nails off. And so um, I had a little crystal ashtray, and it had acetone in it that my fingers were soaking in. So when the lights went out, power went out, I lit a candle. And I had a candle lit, and I was still soaking my fingernails. Well, about after 10 or 12 minutes, the little crystal ashtray with the acetone, it ignited, um, which was no big deal because I picked it up in my right hand, and I thought I would tap the flames out with my left hand. But when I tapped the acetone that was on fire, it just, it splashed. And it was little fireballs uh, fell from my hand all down my leg. Not, not one fireball hit the ground or anything in the house. It all landed on my leg. And I was wearing shorts at the time. And I had flames probably eight inches tall that were burning on my leg. And my girlfriend was there, thank God. She said, Paula, Paula, you're on fire. Well, I didn't care. I didn't feel nothing. I just wanted to get the hose and make sure I squirted the kitchen so it wouldn't catch on fire. There was nothing on fire in the house. I, I don't remember if I dropped and rolled or sh I don't remember. 
I went to the hospital, and they wrapped it up, and they said, um, call St. Francis Burn Center in the morning. If they don't call you, call them. So I drove myself the next day at 11 to San Francisco. When I got in there, I asked her, I still hadn't looked at my injuries. I asked her, am I going to have to stay? She says, oh, yeah. She said, the hospital made it sound like you were just barely even burned, you know, but yeah, you're going to have to stay. And I was in the hospital burn unit from September 9th, 2018 till September 24th, 2018. And I kind of let myself out early because I didn't want to be in there no more. But um, when I went back to my house, I noticed my cat was acting very strange. So I started videoing it. Very strange. And um, can we stop just for a minute? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Paula has just shown me a video of her cat. And uh, I'd, I'd like for you to explain to me what you feel is happening in this video. I think there's some sort of energy. I don't think it was Danny this time, the, the friendly ghost. I think it was something much more sinister, much more dark. Um, and I believe my cat knows it's there. That's why he was walking around like on eggshells. And if you see the video, every time that noise happens, my cat jumped back. Like he was aware that like maybe it touched his nose or maybe, I don't know what. But um, there was something definitely going on in, in that house. It had been going on the whole 19 years I was there. I just, it was so gradual. It, there's numerous, numerous things that happened at the house, but it was so gradual. And so uh, it wasn't scary. It didn't scare me, you know. Um, it was kind of entertaining for a minute. But there, towards the last few months I was there, I believe it was something a lot more, more sinister than that. And, and it happened, the stuff that was happening was much more severe, and it was happening much more more fast it was no longer gradual i could see this stuff happening right in front of my very eyes well let's let's uh take it slow and go through all of that little by little uh and and kind of flesh it out as much as we can first of all uh before you do that though i i'll, I'll give my own uh, impression of the video you showed me there was something strange happening in that video there like you said there was this sound and Every time this sound occurred, uh, the the cat jumped back, almost like someone being shocked. Yeah, um, and and it was like this little. It was a very quick, sharp little sound. That's all I can say about the sound itself. But every time it did, like I said, the the cat would start. Um, it, it, it was strange. I can see what you're talking about in terms of that video. So these. Experiences as they progressed, as they es escalated, uh, let's start at the beginning of that and uh, go into as much detail as we can. Okay. After the video of my cat, uh, it was about 3 in the morning. I'd been home from the hospital after, after being in the burn unit for a month. I'd been home probably four or five days, and um, I hadn't slept much. But after the video, I decided to lay down and try and get some sleep. I was half in and half out of, of being asleep, and I hear something in my bedroom, and it sounded like something electric or something. It sounded like a mosquito or a bee, only 2,500 times louder. And like I said, I was half asleep, half awake. And I'd wondered why none of my 13 cats have knocked whatever it is out of the air yet or, 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 or gone to it. But I hear it getting further away and getting closer. All the time, it, it never left my bedroom, but it got closer and further in the room. And I'm listening to it, and all of a sudden, something hits my arm. I felt it physically hit my arm, and the noise stopped, the buzzing noise. And then I was wide awake. I didn't know what it was that, that hit my arm, but I felt it hit my arm, and the noise stopped. And at that point, I was wide awake, and I knew, well, it wasn't until the next day when I looked at the video that I heard that noise and seen it was involving my cat let me uh just kind of pause for a minute slow down and make sure i'm understanding everything you're saying uh, in this experience when you uh felt something hitting your arm you had been asleep correct i was on my way out yeah i was i was almost asleep right right this this buzzing noise i know that that's a connecting factor um I just want to understand where the buzzing noise occurred in the context of this experience wh when you finally were touched on the arm. It was in my bedroom when I was trying to go to sleep. I heard it in my bedroom buzzing around in my room. 
and um, it never left my room, although it did get closer to me, and then it got further away from me, but it never left my room. And then uh, at the moment you were touched, this buzzing noise stopped. It did. Ah. It stopped. It's kind of interesting. It's like it was. It's like a grounding, like a, a electricity being being grounded. It sounded similar to electricity, I guess, and I'm not sure what it was. I just know this noise stopped when it hit me. You know, I also wanted to mention right now. Uh, it's funny that you tell me this right now because just a few mornings ago, I was asleep, and then I had an experience in which I was touched on my head. Uh, by by a finger very firmly, so it's it's just kind of funny to me that, that you mentioned that same type of experience right now. Well, I had another experience similar when I first moved in the house. It was probably eighteen years prior to that, and I was asleep in the other bedroom. I was falling asleep. I was just the same as I was that night. I was half awake, half asleep, and I don't know what it was, but something woke me. And when I woke up, I was petrified. I couldn't speak and I couldn't move. I was so scared and I don't know what. As soon as I could move, I got my purse and I got out of there. I got in my car and I drove to my friend's house about 15 miles away. And when I got to my friend's house, I was still blubbering. I was... <laughs> and I don't know what it was, but... Interesting. Yeah, there was some sense of something that, that caused this fear. Maybe it had happened on a subconscious level. Maybe you were aware of what you were afraid of on a subconscious level, but in, in your waking physical mind, you, you just didn't know. Uh, to ask somewhat of a delicate question, um, have you had any trauma in your life that could, I mean, we've all had trauma in our lives, sure, but have you had anything that could account for you waking up in a state of fear like that? No. I mean, I come from a broken family. Grew up uh, uh, the youngest of three girls with my mom. At 14 years old, I didn't do rules very well or restrictions, so um, uh, I stopped going to school. I got on a Greyhound at 14, and, and I ran away from home, and I went to Georgia, where my dad lived, to be with him. And uh, it was summer vacation. I had to come back, and I would started the 10th grade. And I was hanging out with a much older man doing stuff I shouldn't have been. I didn't go to school for a month, and I knew I didn't want to go home because... I would be on restriction. I didn't do people tell me what to do very well at all. So I got on a Greyhound bus again the second time. I was just started the 10th grade, and I went again out to Georgia to see my dad. And from that point on, I pretty much raised myself. And um, so I had, I had trauma just because me and my dad were closest out of anyone in my family. Um, and, and have him taken away from me when I was 10. And, uh, yeah, that pretty much... that. That hurt a lot. So I had a lot of defiant acts and stuff growing up. You know, I, uh, I just, I was rebellious. I just did what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Sure. I can relate on a lot of levels to that, certainly. So this experience um, where you were touched and the, there was the buzzing noise that stopped at the moment you were touched, let's progress from there. Uh, in in as exacting detail as we can, kind of flesh out the chronology of what happened from that point on. Well, I knew when I watched the video the next day and I heard the noise and seen my cat reacting, I knew that if we stayed there very much longer, it would be my cat and then it would be me next, just like it was my dog. It was working on my animals and uh, and it was affecting them very much so. So from the time I got out of the hospital, the burn unit, the end of September, after being there 19 years, I had a big backyard, I had a basement, I had a storage shed out back. I called my mom in Oregon, I told her I'll be up there by Christmas. By Christmas, I was all moved out of my house and up, up in Oregon. I left that place. Uh, I had a friend of mine from the church tell me that him and his friends can go through the house and bless it and make sure that whatever was in there would, would leave. And I said, it doesn't matter to me what happens to the house, I'm leaving it, I'm gone, I'm moving, I don't, I, I don't care no more. That house was kind of brutal, you know. It started off slow and gradual, and it got just very intense. And I believe that's what got my dog, because my dog hated that house. She hated the house. She hated going in it. She'd sit out in the car sometimes for hours after we came back from the park, because she just didn't want to go in there. Well, now I feel like bringing the video of my cat and the video of my dog to that veterinarian and telling them, this is what I believe happened. I believe something got inside and possessed her, and that's what happened, period. And 
I want to show you. This is it. These are the oh, the scars I sustained. Yeah, I was gonna ask you how you've been healing. Oh, I'm healed, but uh, also I had the first surgery in my right foot, but my foot's just not healing right, and uh, I just wonder if those that bad n negative energy stuff. I know they can attach to you and go wherever you go, and I'm just wondering if that's maybe what happened. I don't know. What makes you so certain that that it's related? I don't think it's it's well. I do think it's related because something was trying to get me to stand up out of the wheelchair. That would have been that negative energy. And four or five times in the same day, no other day, but just one particular day, something kept trying to, me to, get, to get me to stand up, and it almost worked until it did work. And I thought, that's, some, that's, that's pretty, pretty brutal. Because if, if it wasn't another entity or energy, I would never have done it because I knew I should. Uh, I couldn't stand up on my feet. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, might this just have been your own impatience? Impulse or something? Yeah. No, no. No, no. No, my daughter, when we were getting ready in that house to go, my sister had passed away, and we were going to a get-together after that. My daughter was in the bathroom getting ready, and to this day she never told me what it was, but she ran out of the house. She called my other sister and had her come pick her up and take her away from the house. She never did tell me what it was or why, but... I, I can only imagine. Um, my daughter had like a, uh, a chime right in her doorway. Doorway, if anyone walks in front of it, it go, makes a noise. Well, one day I was there and um, my friend was there. We were in the living room and this chime starts going off. Ding, 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 ding. Like someone was walking in front of it and there was nobody else there. I just figured it was Danny, so I didn't think nothing of it. So these experiences so far that we're talking about, uh, they, these are within, these are relatively recent. These were within the last few years, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, the history of this experience goes back much farther than that, does it not? It goes, yeah, from the, it actually goes from, before I moved in this house, I had an experience. I got an apartment I was at for 16 months while I waited for my voucher to come through. And I was in an apartment for 16 months, and that's where it pretty much started. Um, I don't know what it was, but I wasn't myself. Like, every day I, I did my daughter's homework. We did her homework. She was seven. And we made sure to turn the homework in every day. And on Monday, the report would come back, you know, that the teacher put in her backpack, and she would bring home. And this one particular Monday, she brought something home, and it said we did not, she did not turn in any homework. And I couldn't understand, I couldn't understand it because every day, like clockwork, we would do her homework. Whether it's after school or after dinner, we did her homework every day. And for me not to know for a whole week that we didn't do her homework or didn't turn it in, I just don't know where I was or what I was, or where I was. And, um. Do you recall what kind of state you were in during that week? Like I said, um, I remember it was very strange, very strange. Uh, I was driving my car as fast as I could, which is not like me. And I was drinking alcohol, which is not like me. I wasn't feeling like myself. I remember this one particular time, I wasn't looking out my eyes. I was looking out what appeared to be, I don't know if you've ever seen the eyes on the uh, No Fear. The, you might see the No Fear emblem or with, right. the, with the eyes that kind of got the wave kind of mean or evil or... Yes, I, I, yeah, I know the logo you're talking about. Okay, sure. well, um, I was looking out those eyes. I was looking out eyes. When I looked out, that's what everything appeared. It appeared I wasn't looking out my eyes at all. It appeared I was looking out those type of eyes. And that was so strange to feel like you're looking out something else's eyes. H had you ever experienced anything like that before? No, no, hmm. no, never have. And what did you experience as you were looking out of these eyes? I just, I didn't experience, I was just at my friend's house, and I just remember not seeing the way I normally see. I remember it just didn't seem like my eyes I was looking out. I was able to see everything like I should have, but I was seeing it differently than normally. I'd, I'd like to take a minute to try and understand that as best we can. So... Objects appeared normal. They looked they looked the same as they normally would. Am I understanding yeah. that part correctly? Yeah. Okay. Was it that what you were seeing was tainted by an emotion or 
uh, was there a visual component, like uh, like maybe some sort of tint over what you were seeing? I, I, I don't know. I just, I can't, I don't know how to answer that. I just know I wasn't looking out my eyes. Okay. That's the best I can describe it. Right, yeah, I understand. It's it's so difficult to explain these things sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I, I really get you. So, okay. So during that week, you were looking out of different eyes. Just, something... just at one particular time, I was looking out those eyes, and um, it was just some strange stuff. I didn't know why we hadn't turned my daughter's homework in. I was expecting to get a report on Monday, and I got a letter that said she didn't turn her homework in. And I don't know why we didn't or where, what I was doing that I couldn't do that. But that's, w- that's when it first started. And I lived there for 16 months. Then I moved to the house I was at for 19 years. It may have attached itself from there. And I often wondered, why is it that all these houses I'm moving to, there's something funky about it with the negative ne- energy or the whatever you want to call it. And then I thought to myself, maybe it's not the houses I'm moving to. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. Must be me. Well, I've spoken to other people uh, who have had similar experiences in that no matter where they go, it follows them around. So, I I mean, let's explore that. Do you you feel like you picked something up while living in that apartment? Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. So, and then you, obviously, you had this experience where you were seeing things differently, experiencing things differently. Uh, You were kind of out of it for that week. What happened next? Uh, no, that's about the, shortly after that is when I moved to the house in in Antioch. But I'm I'm gonna tell you something that now that we're back in Antioch, okay, this is kind of kind of entwines into this. I'd mentioned that J.C. Dugard girl that that was missing. Yeah. Okay. I'm at my house in Antioch and um. I had a cat I loved very much. She was born at my house when I was in Concord. She was 16 years old when she passed away. She lived at my mom's house for 14 of those years. Then my mom moved to Oregon, so I had to bring my cat out to Antioch where I was living. And she was, she was there for about a year and a half, and something got a hold of her, and she was tore, ripped open. All her, her whole stomach, her insides were torn out, and I had to have her put down. I believe it might have been raccoons, although... No raccoons have ever done that to any of the cats around that house. I have feral cats. I have stray cats. I have my own cats. I'm a cat person. But I had to put my my cat down because of that. So one night, uh, it was late at night, midnight, one in the morning, the cats, the raccoons would come over the fence I have, and they would eat the cat food on the porch. So I would learn to keep the cat food in at night and no raccoons. Well, this night I was feeling frisky, so I put cat food out after dark. And I waited for him to come, and I had a BB gun with a CO2 cartridge. No. Yep. And here they come. They climb over the fence, and I was shooting at one. I didn't realize till the next day, but I shot my car window out. So I had to call Wisecracker, and they came and they put another window in, in my car. So now I have to have it tinted because all the other windows are tinted. And I look in the phone book, and I'm looking under places to tint my car window, and there's quite a few places in there, but I picked one. It was on Walnut Avenue. I went there the next day, and he does the work out of his backyard, so I drove down a long driveway when I got to his house, and uh, I sat in his backyard while he, he tinted my window, and I was there for about 45 minutes or maybe an hour, and it's in an unincorporated part of the town. There's nothing around. I was able to take in everything 360 degree uh, around me, and there was nothing, no houses, no buildings, just... So when he was done... I was driving my car down his driveway, and I I reached the street, which was Walnut, and I noticed across the street and over one house, there was two police cars. One of them was white, and one was black and white. I didn't figure too much. I thought maybe domestic violence or not too much. I didn't figure, so I just went. I went to my girlfriend's house a couple miles away. We're watching the the news that was on. It was at noon, 12 o'clock, and they had aerial shots of this house where the police cars were at. They had aerial shots. They had found J.C. Dugard, who was kidnapped 18 years prior to that in El Dorado County by this man and woman who brought her to their house, which was across the street and over one house from where I got my window tinted. Well, when I watched the aerial shots on the the news, they wouldn't tell us where it was, but I knew where it was because I just sat 
in the backyard and took all that information in while I was waiting. I told my girlfriend, I says, I gotta go. And I left, and I went right back to where I just got my window tinted. And they had news crews, they had ABC, CBS, CNN, they had Fox News, they had everything. I was able to go in there, get pictures of them towing the van out from the backyard, and I actually have with me this uh, thing I wasn't supposed to take, but it stuck to my car tire, so I wound up with it. That was the red tag that they red tagged the house she was found in. Really? Really. Wow. This is this is regarding J.C. Dugard. Mm-hmm. Okay? This was, this, if you notice, oh, well, here come the goosebumps. The, the man that kidnapped her, he had her working for him. She was with him for 18 years. She, she got pregnant with she has two children by this man that kidnapped her he had a printing business where he printed up brochure he printed up flyers and business cards and such my friend Vijan had a shop downtown Antioch he he sold t-shirts and pictures and stuff J.C. Dugard and the bad guy Philip actually went door to door downtown asking people if they needed business cards printed up my friend Vijan said he did and and he had J.C. Dugard is the one that Printed this and printed those up for my friend's shop. He put these on sunglasses. This was a business card that J.C. Dugard herself printed up. Here's the receipt. The same day she was found, the same street she was found on, it was across the street and over one house. Now, I just wonder what caused, what got me, why I shot my car window out in the first place, but then out of all the places, I chose that place. And then when I seen the police cars as I was leaving, then I seen it on the news. I went back. All the news crews was there. I was there for some reason. And it's connected to another, you know, missing person, another kidnapping. How, how does the red tag factor in, just so I'm clear? This is the house. They red tagged the house that she was found at. She was found living in a tent in the backyard. And she sued the Concord Parole or Police Department, Parole Department for not failing to find her sooner because the man that kidnapped her was on parole. And the parole agents had been to his house a couple of times for a couple different reasons, but never found her. She was in a tent in the backyard. They should have been able to locate her. Conquer Police, her parole department, who is who I blame for letting that organization run their organization. Years prior to that, when, when the man wanted to take me out of the country under a different last name, it was through the Conquer Parole Department. They're the ones that have the parolees housed at that motel where I met the man. All right. I believe there were some bad seats at the Concord Parole Department or Police Department at that time that were up to no good. And I believe, I mean, I went to them for help and they did not help me out at all. The police department, in fact, he just told me not to go there. But the red tag, it just, I, I, that's the house, 18 years. These, J.C. Dugard herself printed up. Here's a receipt to say I went there and got my window tinted the day I seen. Everything happened. It just came into, everything lined up perfect right. for it to happen like that. Um, Right, and I can s- clearly see the connections that you're talking about, and I can clearly see there, there, there's a clear connection there. I, I can see why you uh, are seeing these things, and I'm, I'm inclined to agree that that is probably the case. Do you know if the man who kidnapped J.C. Dugard was himself involved in any tra- trafficking endeavors? I don't know what else he was involved in, although I do know... There's a man named He's dead now. But I didn't want to talk about this, but you can edit whatever you want, uh, whatever I, I or, yeah. Uh, he had a junkyard, and the junkyard was about five miles, six miles from where this girl was found. Also, this girl was found just a mile and a half from my house. But the junkyard was about six miles from where she was held for 18 years. Now, and was the owner of the junkyard, and was the bad guy. They knew each other. They had some sort of relationship. I don't know what kind of relationship. The daughter, my, the father of my daughter, he worked for at the junkyard at night. He would spend the night there, make sure no one broke into it, the place. Well, my daughter, who was about 12, I'm not sure how old she was at this time, seven, eight, nine. I'd have to think. But uh, my, my daughter was friends with his daughter owner of the junkyard although I didn't like he didn't like me my daughter was friends with his daughter through my daughter's dad anyway I know that that his daughter went to a 16th birthday party she had a 16th birthday party at a water park and I know that Philip and JC Dugard's two daughters Angel and Starlet I know they were at the party as well 
I know that when stuff when it when stuff got thick, the authorities um, they were looking for anything that had to do with J.C. Dugard. They they raided the junkyard. They looked, brought, took his computers in, whatever he had. They went to his house in a different city and they raided that. And um, I know that if they would have went to wife's mom's house. They probably would have found a lot of stuff they were looking for. Uh, my daughter used to go to that house too on 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 Labor Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July. Whenever they had uh, barbecues and an occasion, they would invite my daughter over. I believe I believe I have a link here that might be able to help in some uh, cases. I just think I truly believe J.C. I mean um, the bad guy Philip. Yeah, he was probably involved in more than just just J.C. Dugard. But I believe his sentence was 400 and something years, so he kind of got, he got what he had coming for sure. Right. Uh, and you didn't want to talk about the junkyard or, or the name. Do you want me to edit that out, or do you want me to just kind of omit that name but leave it in? Leave, omit that name. I definitely wouldn't speak about this while he was alive because of, of, of consequences. Right, of course not. Um, so yeah, I'll 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 take out those names, but I'll leave that segment in because it's important to the the whole understanding of what we're talking about. And yeah, I'm I'm clearly seeing this connection between all these things that you're fleshing out, and it also seems to me like you are you you have a karmic tie to this whole thing in that I mean you're involved in it somehow and things keep lining up so that you are witness to it or a participant or something you Third have party you have uh, 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 accessory i just uh, there's something i don't know what it is but i believe and i had mentioned to you the irene garza name mm -hmm. yeah she was a lady who was murdered um 60 something years ago i never did meet her i responded to an ad in in craigslist they needed someone to come in and keep his elderly mother company in between um they had they had a caregiver come in uh, day shift and night shift. They wanted me to come in between when there was no one there, keep her company. So I did. Well, keep who company uh, now? It was Josie. And come to find out, it was <clears throat> her sister that was murdered 60 years prior to that in McKellen, Texas. She went to church. It was the pastor that did it. They pulled him in for questioning when it happened. They had no reason to believe it was him, so they let him go. Years and years later, in like 2019, more evidence came up, and they pulled him back in for questioning. This time they convicted him of the murder that happened 60 years prior to that. Now, when I went over to Josie's house and would keep her company in and stay with her, I seen pictures in the hallway in the house and in the garage. They were the same pictures that the news was putting on the TV remembering, uh, what was her name? It was a Garza. Yeah, Irene Garza. Irene Garza, yeah. And she was a school teacher, something very nice, but same pictures on the news that I seen in this lady's house because it was her sister. Mm -hmm. But I just thought that was kind of weird that I answered to an ad that... Yet another yeah. strange disappearance, strange murder, or under strange circumstances. Huh. You kind of do uh, seem to be part of, you know, this... this intricate working of, of things yeah uh, have you ever thought about you know making use of that to uh to to i honestly to some end i honestly don't know how to make use of it i don't know what it is i know i've got something i don't know if there's a word for it or not but um i would i i really would like to utilize it but first i guess i have to know what it is but um i just wish there was someone out there that could help me with that because uh it's something there's something uh i call it espn like ESP with a twist, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Well, I mean, I, th I think you're, it, it seems like you're part of this thing for a reason. Like, yeah. you, like you're supposed to participate in some way and, and you're gathering information, you're doing what you're supposed to do. So, so that's great. I think you're on the right track. Um, as for what that end is supposed to be, you know, I mean, it's anybody's guess at the, at the moment, but I, I admire what you're doing. We're, we're in the last few minutes of the show now. There, there's all sorts of stuff. I, I, I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff that we haven't covered yet. Um, I would like to do a follow-up maybe sometime over the phone. So in the last few minutes of the show, is there anything that you wanted to discuss? Is there anything in particular that you wanted to bring to my attention? 
or our attention. I just, I just, um, I just would like to to get some information on um, the detectives back in 1985 at the Concord Police Department, and I'd like to know if my feeling, if my gut feeling was right all along, and if the p police department or a couple of detectives in there was getting paid to let this organization run their their thing. That's the main thing. That's what I think all this is about. I think in the end, I. It might be bringing me back to some closure for the incident that happened in 1985. Right. Yeah. And, and you are very emotional about it. You, you have deep, deep feelings about this. It's, it's clear to see. Yeah, it was close. It was a close call. Mm hmm Certainly. And, and you, you bring that same feeling to these other missing persons cases or these strange disappearances slash human trafficking. Yeah. Right. This is this is something that means a lot to you. I can yeah. tell. Yeah, and I believe if someone, if the right person was out there that could, I could talk to. I believe we could probably find out what happened to Dottie Kalor, since it was her husband who tried to get me to go to a different country under a different last name, and I know for a fact it was him, even though 15 years had passed uh, when I seen him, I knew immediately. And uh, I, I would like to find out where she's at. I would like her family to have closure as well. Well, if you let me, I will take some pictures of the some of the documents that you have shown me. Okay. And uh, I'll, if, if you're okay with it, I will yeah. put them on my, my show's Instagram sure. feed. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to remind everyone, they can look at all media pertaining to this show, or all pictures pertaining to this show. At, exhibits. Right, all exhibits. Exhibit A, B, and C, et cetera. Uh, you can find them on Instagram. Just look for Type 471 Podcast. Paula, you, you've got just so much going on. I feel like we just barely scratched the surface. Uh, but I, I do honestly see this connection that you're talking about amongst all these things and your, your place in it, your participation there. So I, whatever, whatever it is and whatever you're doing, keep doing it. I think, you're, I think you're doing well. And I can tell you're a very observant and very detail-oriented person. So I, I think you've got the tools to follow through with whatever you're meant to follow through with, just, yeah. just please stay safe. Don't yeah. do anything that, that's going to put yourself in danger. Yeah. All right. Well, we are at the end of the show. Thank you so much for coming to see me today. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate uh, your, your traveling here uh, to see me. Uh, it, it, the sun, it, we started this conversation <laughs> in the shade, and now the sun is beating down on us. It's so. gorgeous. It's beautiful. Oh, it's a beautiful day yeah. for sure. But uh, it's time to get back into the shade. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paula, thank you so much for being on Type 471. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Well, we'll, we'll talk again very soon. Okay. Type 471 Podcast now has a website where you can access full episodes of this show and connect with me on social media, as well as report your own unknown, unexplained, or paranormal experiences to me. Just visit type471.wordpress.com. Be sure to subscribe to be notified when new episodes of this show are released. Also, check out my YouTube channel. On YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, or anywhere else on social media, just look for Type 471 Podcast. Given the complex and somewhat tricky subject matter discussed in this episode, I ask that if you have any information pertaining to what was discussed, that you report it to me. Visit the website, type471.wordpress.com, click on the Report Your Experience page, fill out the form, and submit it to me. I'm Sam Kitchen. Thanks for listening to Type 471. <laughs>